Sam is squirming. Look at him, his little face. No, I good. just immediately, no, I just thought of a reference to Friends, that episode of Friends. Oh, yeah, like a one, like, a one, two, a one, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. three, yeah. <laughs> yes. A seven, 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 seven. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, exactly. Exactly that episode, I immediately, and I was like, like, I gotta contain myself, I can't. <laughs> no, I think it's a very helpful visual here. Hey, you're listening to Sam and Am Solve the World's Problems. You guys, the amount of problems, they're building up. They're building up, they're growing, it's too much. I don't understand. We've got to solve some. So today, we're going to be talking to a person who has many, many hats. Um, She's a professional leader of social work. She's a clinical sexologist. She's a researcher in resilience and spirituality. And we're going to be talking to her today about taboo topics. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, She's so insightful. Yeah, and we really appreciated her honesty and willingness to share and discuss these taboo topics in a way that's really comfortable for us and hopefully really comfortable for you too. Yeah, so please enjoy the conversation with Candice Care Unger. Woo! Hi, welcome to our podcast, Candice. It's really awesome to have you here. A little bit scary. Um, I'm yeah, a bit thanks. scared about this episode, but it'll be good. <laughs> Why are you scared, Emily? No need because, to be scared. Because it's taboo. It's taboo for a reason. Because I'm awkward about it. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, let's get into a little bit about who you are for our listeners. Um, we, like, side note, we just went over some of your... <laughs> Prof- profession beforehand and I've got literally an entire A4 page of yeah, your I have qualifications like and eight bullet points of your actual <laughs> jobs, your degrees, um, the committees that you're a part of. It's you have a lot of things. I'm I've it's over-invested awesome. invested in my brain. Yeah, but like so tell the us- heck that'll be worth it, I'm sure. <laughs> oh yeah. Tell us a little bit a little bit about um what you do. Okay, so I'm a social worker by background. I work in a hospital in Sydney. Um, at the moment, these days, 15 years into my career, I work as the professional leader of social work. So I look after our team of social workers, which is about 20 all up, um, across inpatient and community uh, teams. And then I also have a clinical load as a clinical sexologist um, and work in a specialist disability and sexuality clinic. How many? Okay, because like, and you've told us the amount of degrees and the amount of like things that you do for work and how, how many hours do you spend at work per week? Because I know you're also a mother. Physically at work, I spend 32 hours, give or take. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. For someone who can't do maths, say, four days a week. Is that normal? Four. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and, when you. And when you say physically at work, is that because it's a particularly like mentally demanding job and you're kind of uh, always... Sometimes. And I think also when you manage a big team, sometimes people make contact with you outside of that. And that's of course. Com- completely okay. Um, and at different times throughout the year, I've worked full time and then I've worked part time and it just, um, my tenure, I've been there for 13 years and I've gone from full time to two days a week to full time to two days a week, just depending on where I'm at with my own family, with, yeah, the maternity leave, uh, study, cause I have never worked full time and studied full time. I've dropped back part time to be able to, to accommodate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, or I've done some comments to different places, different projects, etc. So it's a very fluid relationship. <laughs> but I'm, nice. I'm lucky to have a very supportive employer who understands my uh, needs to spread my wings and do different things. Yeah, yeah. That, is, that is awesome. I was going to say, it sounds like a really healthy relationship with work. Yeah, which but I'm- yeah, it's good to let work be integrated into your life um, and make sure that you still get to live your life. Yeah. So your most recent sort of degree and hat that you've put on is uh, the postgrad in sexual health re- and reproduction and psychosexual therapy, Insecure. right? Yeah, correct. So why did you decide to do that? Oh, mate, okay. The short version is um, I had a client who had a sex problem and I didn't know how to help them. And when I tried to find someone to help them, there was no one to help them. So I think um, sometimes you just look. <laughs> I'm like – jaw dropped right now because that is the most <laughs> expensive hard <laughs> version of oh i don't know but i'll go find out for you honey like, <laughs> that was that's so extra but also good on you but i also think sometimes it's like a gap in the market and yeah. it takes somebody to say hey i have this problem and it god that must have taken so much courage to say i have this problem yeah. um and and then to find that there's nobody there uh, as a clinician that left me feeling pretty crap like if you know that you've got this issue you're holding this issue and you can't do anything with it and you feel completely incompetent in it um yeah i don't like feeling incompetent so i just went and did a degree well, in it you know what? <laughs> <laughs> someone needs to upskill 
well, it may as well be me. <laughs> so I've specialised in um, sexual health and um, sexuality in terms of relationships and, and also sexual functioning um, for people who are also living with disability. Yeah. Nice. And that's going to be, have a lot to do with our first problem. But before we get into that, I still want to know so much more about you. Um, cool. Like you also are a researcher as part of your job mm. in resilience and also in spirituality, spirituality. but from an academic yeah. level, yeah. which I find so interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, I can send you to my research, research gate or my LinkedIn profiles and you can um, find the links Love it. Yeah, um, yeah. to our peer-reviewed published articles. But um, I guess the, since about 2009, I've been on a research group um, looking at resilience after traumatic injury, um, particularly in spinal cord injury and brain injury. Uh, we run an intervention program for families around, um, I guess, adjusting to the challenges and changes that happen um, after a traumatic injury because we know that spinal cord injury and brain injury affect a whole family. It's not just the person. So um, there's that. And then the spirituality program. So um, we have, about three years ago now, the Community Christ funded a um, project at the hospital. So the West Penton Hills Congregation funded a project at the hospital, which is like a lot of money over a couple of years. But it was an opportunity for us to um, develop a staff training program at the hospital for how to talk about spirituality, to incorporate spiritual distress, spiritual need, um, issues of spirituality in a rehab setting. So, I still want to ask, because um, I feel like we've got like all of the really functional aspects about like who you are and what you've done, but can I just ask, uh, I'm going to. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I just want to know kind of um, like you do, ha- you have had a significant career so far in, in social work and all these different degrees that you've got. And I, w- I would love to know kind of what maybe your proudest achievement would have been either in the last year or the last 15 years. Last 15 been- years. I reckon, honestly, getting this sexuality clinic over the line is pretty awesome. Um, so that's a big win to have an uh, organisation self-fund and back me in this idea that we, one, can do it and two, yeah. have a market for it and that it will be like a business opportunity that is successful and that we will also – meet the needs of people with disability in a very unique way. And I think the NDIS has created space for this conversation to happen in a way um, that, you know, we are just talking before about being taboo topics, but in a way that I think Mm -hmm. society is moving into recognising that we are all, you know, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, sexual beings. And and that includes people with disability. So I think getting the sexuality clinic over the line is definitely up there. Um, and that I'm looking forward to just doing that full time for the next 12 months. So if you ask me in December what my job title is, it'll just be like team leader for sexuality services and that'll be oh, fantastic. It. <laughs> nice. And it'll be less confusing than all these other jobs. Nice. Okay. Now can we jump into problem one? Yep. Sure. Sorry. Yep. So without further ado then, um, um, I can't wait to talk to you about these problems and you are clearly qualified. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's get into problem number one, which is all about. Problem number one is at born out of the fact that <laughs> Sam and I are very uncomfortable already, um, and it's how do we talk about sex? I think Emily. Do we need to? Are, no, do we, let's do we skip need to talk about it. Sex? Okay, move on. No, problem number two. Uh, <laughs> Too funny. All right. No, but genuine question: Do we need to? Do we need to talk about sex? Yeah. I think that that completely depends on if you want to, and if you want to talk about it, and you don't know how to talk about it then that is where the challenge is. And for the people that I see post-injury who have this like new injury and maybe maybe a problem with how sex is working in their relationship or not or uh, sometimes people just don't have the vocabulary to how to talk about it. And the last thing you want is people to be suffering in silence. So if you have a sex problem and you don't know how to talk about it and you want to talk about it, then I think that is maybe what we need to talk about. My... Brain then goes to like, I don't know, uh, if I have a sex problem and I want to talk about it, but nobody else talks about Mm. sex, then it feels like a huge thing to talk about. Whereas if we kind of normalize the conversation a bit more, it would open it up a bit more to people just having more conversations about sex and then could maybe feel more comfortable talking about their problems. Yeah. But also, I'm terrified. So, 
And I think you're terrified probably because you had a shitty sexual health education at your high school. And I think that when we come back to the sexual health curriculum that we see in schools at the moment, most adolescents don't learn how to talk about sex in a positive way. And so what we're talking about here is like sex positivity. And a lot of our families, because of culture and whatever, we just call it family of origin things, um, we don't really talk about it within our families. And then we just have this stunted vocabulary that doesn't allow us to express a concern. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking about my sexual education from high school, my public high school. Um, and, you know, it was fantastic. I honestly, no, thinking back, I cannot remember ever having it. Like, oh, yeah, I people remember. Talk about their experiences. There. Yeah, no, sorry if that wasn't clear. But <laughs> I remember the put a condom on a banana thing, okay. but I only remember it because my friend thought it would be funny if she put it on her foot and she fit it and it was funny. I was going to say, I don't even remember One that. I don't think we even got the bare basics. Like, I don't remember where I learned that. Okay, I see the importance, though, now, for sure, and I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah. Okay, no matter so, how uncomfortable I may be. All right. There's, the first thing I just want us to help with our comfort level is what we're talking about here is, like, sexual health literacy. And so you just think of it like any other part of your life that you become more literate in. There's some things that you need to learn, and there's probably some things you need to unlearn. And as you kind of go along um, and you read more things uh, or you talk to other people about very taboo topics like this, so you'll be like, wow, I had this assumption or this presumption and how do I unlearn it? Like, where did I even learn that and how do I unlearn it? And not talking about sex has probably been modeled to you. So you've, you've learned not to talk about it because people around you don't talk about it as opposed to there's, any, there's absolutely nothing wrong with talking about sex. Yeah, and I guess it's also like it's rude. It's rude? <laughs> like, Why is it rude? No, I mean that's what would it would be perceived. Like, I don't know, you're at a family dinner. Would you well, bring it up? Time and a place. Do you talk about your bowel motion at dinner? Like um, if there's cheese involved, it's gonna come up. <laughs> so there we go. So this is my like my perspective at the hospital is if we can talk about bowel motions, if we can talk about urine output, then we can talk about sexual function. It's just a bodily function. So now we talk about bladder, bowel, skin, sexual function, the end. Yeah. Nice. Okay. What was the question for the problem? How do we talk about it? How, like, how do we actually yeah, okay. go about talking about it in like our daily lives? Yeah. So we've established the fact that now we, we've decided we want to talk about it. What do we do? You find a safe person that is also wanting to talk about it. Um, you maybe narrow down the, what is it particularly that you'd like to talk about? Um, I think if there's, that's such a hard question. <laughs> how, how do we talk about it? We yeah. we are we normalize it. We are positive about it. We are non judgmental about it. We are open. We take a curiosity. It's a human experience. I, did you guys ever watch that movie Kinsley? You are probably too young. It was like in the sixties and seventies. Anyway, Mm-mm. um, so there's this very famous person who did this study on sexual behaviors in a time where we did not talk about sex even more so than now. And I guess what he found was, like, people do all kinds of stuff. And most of us, unless we call it, like, a sexual attitude reassessment, like a SARS, right? So the things I thought I knew I no longer know um, because I have I had my eyes opened by watching a documentary or mm-hmm. by reading something kind of completely different to what I would normally read and just trying to experience and understand another person's perspective. Okay, so on improving our, I guess, sexual literacy, yeah. what would be some steps we could take um, um, to do that? Yeah so, so, uh, yeah, so we talk about actual body parts. Could, sure, and I, and I got I'm them gonna, down. Yeah, okay. I reckon. <laughs> like my five-year-old. <laughs> but I'm like, list them. <laughs> Don't need to do that. But you know, I think this kind of can start early. Like, I'm just trying to think about what's the age appropriate thing. Like, so for the five year old, she knows all of her own body parts. She knows she has a vulva, mm-hmm. she has a vagina. When she has a rash on her vulva, she says, "Ow, my vulva's stingy." Um, that is like more literacy than I have. Well, there you go, Emily. Fully functioning adult. <laughs> I don't think I've ever used the word vulva in my everyday life. Oh, really? Life. Okay. Well, maybe. Okay. Well, now you have. You just did then. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> Evolving and growing. Yeah, but that's really impressive. Part of it, I think, is comes with confidence, right? And so the more you are familiar with a vocabulary that is sex positive, then um, I guess the more confident you're going to become with how to actually bring it up. In the hospital setting, the training I do is 
um, we are better off either doing it as the declarative, like we know after a spinal cord injury people will have um, some challenges with their sexual functioning. If you have a problem and you'd like to talk to me or you have any concerns, I'm available. If you don't want to talk to me, you can talk to somebody else and I'll hook you up with that person. And it's sort of like an invitation. So you're inviting mm-hmm. somebody else to talk about it or we do it as like a screening question. You know, every time you see somebody, you ask about these things, including... Sexuality. Just constantly giving out that kind of um, it's like it's normal. It's like fishing, man. You know, you just yeah. like... Yeah, you just keep throw offering. the bait in, you just keep yeah. offering, and then eventually if that person wants to, they pick it up. But also you've got to allow the space for someone to say, this isn't for me right now. Like you mm-hmm. don't need to push this on other people. Um, and so I think the reason I've stumbled on your question about like how do we talk about sex positively is I'm like trying to think about it in like a casual conversation as opposed to like a clinical conversation. And I guess I do this in work space yeah. comfortably. Um, And that's because they see me as the person to talk to about sex. And so the way I do that is openly, honestly, non-judgmentally. But but how would I just do that at the dinner table? I probably – depends who I'm having at the table, (laughs) you know? (laughs) No, we wouldn't. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Depends on the context. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Exactly. I want to ask, and it's not a fully formed question in my head yet, my okay, so I can only like I don't have a lot of experience with sex with people with disabilities and all that kind of stuff. So my when I t- think about like talking about sex, my brain goes to like the common issues that women face, which is stuff like endometriosis and all that kind of stuff, like pain. How yeah, how I don't I feel like I just want to say that like I don't even know. How do we talk about pain and sex and how do we normalize all those things and like take away the shame from it because it's a really hard thing to go through and I just like don't know how to tell people that it's okay yeah I don't know how to start that conversation I think the last thing we want is people to be suffering in silence about a a problem like and this is a bodily like in in some regards it's a bodily functioning problem or it's a it's just a variation or it's a difference, but I think it's kind of about how the person perceives it themselves, right? So if you, if you or I were distressed about something that was happening sexually, it's like, do I feel comfortable and confident to talk to my partner about it? Is my partner and I, I, like, that's where the dialogue has to start and the communication has to start. Is uh, my partner and I on the same page? Are we comfortable? Um, Do we have a way to um, enjoy pleasurable sexual activity in other ways. Like I think as a culture, we can be quite obsessed with penetrative sex and just think, oh, you know, man, woman, penetrative sex, that's like vaginal sex is kind of the ideal. But there's so many way more interesting sexual activities that can be done that are very pleasurable that have absolutely nothing to do with penetrative sex. And so I think like in our context, you know, if someone has an issue with either sexual function and therefore penetrative sex is off the table or unenjoyable, then it's sort of like, well, how do you wind it right back to the basic functions of what, I kind of say, what role does sex play in your relationship? And it can call, like, there's five basic functions, intimacy, procreation, pleasure, self-esteem. I don't know how many have I said already. I've probably That's four. Before. Self-esteem, I would never have thought, I would have maybe got the, the first three, but I never would have thought that you could have a list of five functions of sex. You don't reckon? Have I, like, over-clinicalized this? Sorry. It makes sense no, to me. No, I think that's really interesting because I would have just been like, well, obviously, reproduction and pleasure. I probably would have got stuck there, but the fact you said intimacy as well, obviously. Tension that- reduction, that's the other one. Tension? So, yeah. Tension reduction. Stress management, my friend. It comes back to one of the five basic um, purposes of sex that, and how they're integrated into your relationship. So the five basic kind of um, purposes of sex are either pleasure, tension reduction, self-esteem, intimacy, or procreation. And so if we're, I guess in my assessment, I'm trying to understand um, where the sexual problem or the sexual stressor concern is, and then what role is it playing in the person's relationship and also for themselves, because a sex problem is both an individual problem and a couple problem. And being able to um, identify where the issue lies completely changes the treatment plan. Okay. When I've, you say, sorry, when you say you sex go. problem, do you mean like like a genuine biological issue or just like it, 
a communication kind of issue? It could be both, mate. Like it could be it could be that neither couple partner knows how to talk about sex, how to initiate sex. They're maybe dissatisfied with the frequency of sex in their relationship. Um, it might be a communication issue around the interpretation of what sex actually is, where one is thinking, yeah, penetrative sex is the only thing. Another person saying, I don't orgasm from that. And that wasn't at all pleasurable. I'm just, you know, kind of maybe doing it as like a bonding activity for the intimacy in our relationship. But the pleasure part of our relationship isn't being addressed. Um, so I guess, like I was kind of saying, it depends on what the issue is. And I see a variety of different things. I I really like that you, the, the five things again, because like, when you talk about it, I think the first thing that comes to mind is reproduction. Yeah, it's because you have Education Australia. Yep. But then you come to the function of sex in, like, that's always going to be the last reason. Like, how many times are you going to reproduce in your life? Yeah. And if you only did it because you want a baby, you would only do it, like, then, then you one, would two times. maybe go to IVF Australia or something like that. And yeah. Like, there's so many other ways to have a baby. If, if if what you really want to do is have a baby, then you would have a baby. Yeah. But if you want to have a pleasurable sexual relationship, then you would probably address some of the functional aspects of what's happening. Yeah, that's not in the curriculum, is it? Pleasure? No. <laughs> that's why you go to post-grad study. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other end. Yeah, I'll just go grab a degree real quick. Here. Like, you want to anything? <laughs> yeah, so there's like sexual difficulties and then there's sexual dysfunction and – most people will have some kind of sexual difficulty in their life, whether it's they booze too much and they got the, you know, droop or whatever. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> sexual difficulties happen mm-hmm. to everybody at some point in their life, but most people will kind of, you know, get over it. It's like a thing that happened occasionally and, you know, your self-esteem is internally shattered because of it. But then we have like a sexual dysfunction and that happens on, you know, 70% to 100% of the time. And you are distressed by it. And that's how we like would diagnose it in terms of, you know, is there a distress around your sexual because lots mm. of lots of people will have sexual dysfunction and completely not bothered by it. So it's not a problem. If it's not a problem for you, it's not a problem for anyone else. Um, but if you are distressed by it and it's happening persistently, then there's lots of different options. I think we should maybe go back to talking broadly around where do you get help? Yes, yes. Also, we have a lot more listener questions have come. Oh, up. yeah, cool. Let's like do listener questions. More. Okay, but let's just do listener questions. Help would be really good if you can just yeah. Okay, so if you have a sexual problem and and whether it's a difficulty that's bothering you or it's a dysfunction, and you think I have now listened to this podcast on Sam and her problems and realized that I too have a problem that has treatable help options, then the best place to start is your GP, and they. Or your sexual health clinic, like every local health district has a sexual health clinic. Um, and whilst they predominantly specialise in sexually transmitted infections, HIV management, they're also very good with other sexual health concerns. Um, so you could either go to your sexual health clinic or you could go to your GP or you could go if it was a sex problem that was affecting your relationship and you thought that you know you wanted some more like sex therapy or psychosexual therapy, which is more like what I do. Uh, you could go to the Society for Australian Sexologists and find an accredited psychosexual therapist or sexual health educator, depending on what it is you think you need, uh, in your local area by searching. On that, really quick, these things are normal and fixable, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. Can you just affirm me for a second that they're all normal? They're all normal. <laughs> they're all, okay, I think they're all common, but they're not necessarily normal, okay? Yeah. So whilst, and I think... The important part to remember is that whilst they're common, they are treatable. Yeah. And that we shouldn't suffer in pain and think that this sexual problem is normal because this sexual problem could be treated and you could have a much more pleasurable sexual life and wouldn't that be way more fun? Um, Because sex is meant to be fun. And if it's not fun, then it's not right. And so, yeah, the best option is to seek help. And And if you're, like, seeking help but it's not, like actually helping or if you're like I mean I know that particularly for women there are just like not a lot of people who specialize in all these different things so it's really hard to find someone who actually knows what they're talking about so so you would find yourself to the Society of Australian Sexologists website and you would find yourself a female sexual health 
And you can find that in the podcast notes. Yes, Yes, you can. can. (laughs) Oh my god, I love those guys. I know when when those two talked to that person about that thing specifically that one. It was so good. I loved it. Look, we're just here interrupting to tell you to please share this with some friends. Yeah, if you could just like tell three friends about this podcast, that would mean the world to us. Um. Alternatively, you could post about us on your social media. That would also be very helpful. Um, it would be more than three friends who would sort of get that word of mouth. Um, but yeah, that would be really helpful for us. And that's that's all we really need to say. So yeah, if you could help support the podcast by sharing it with your friends, that would be amazing and we love you. Yeah. Back to uh, those super awesome people talking about that super awesome thing. Love the chat about that thing. Um, okay. Listen to questions. I always say virginity is a construct and then don't know how to back it up. Please help. I would agree with you. I don't know how to back it up. I don't even know what that means. I think my my question back to the listener is, are they talking about when you first have sex, you're losing something? And maybe in fact, you're not losing anything. You're maybe. Yeah, let's run with that. Oh, yeah, because the, the language something. around it. Yeah. I lose my virginity. Let's run with that. Yeah, and I think like that's. And I think the vocabulary around losing kind of also says like I'm losing some dignity or I'm losing or some purity. self-worth or purity. Yeah. And so if, it, if it's loaded in like a, I've lost something, therefore I'm less than, then I would agree in the whole social construct point that the original question poser was mm-hmm. positioned. But I can't say that this <laughs> is much that I have thought of before this question was posted. Yeah. Right. Well, I think the way to, I guess, answer that question then is that, yeah, I wouldn't say you're losing anything. <laughs> like the fact yeah, that the, absolutely the language not. around it is you lose it. Like that's kind of, I don't know if that answers the question, but I feel like it helps to back it up. It's just a growth thing. I mean, I don't think we're answering the question at all because we're, we're not giving a lot of great ways to back it up. But, yeah, but I'm just saying. Well, like, I yeah. think the, the way to back it up, if someone was to say, oh, virginity is a social construct, I think what we're talking about here is that society has put value on the virginity and yeah and by that yeah. it, and that is kind of being seen as pure and that whole like purity piece um and that is based on religion and history and culture and all that kind of yeah thing. you know yeah. That's, that's how we kind of you know gender is a social construct we you can look at all of that judith butler work around you know performance you know gender performance you know why do women have long hair and men have short hair we we has been trained to perform this way. We women wear certain clothes, men wear certain clothes, and all of that is a social construct. So I think if she's talking about, or he's talking about, virginity being a social construct, it's probably more about how society has viewed purity. And yeah, wh- my feedback to that would be, you're not losing anything. The, the word loss is. Yeah. Play this potentially audio problematic clip as backup. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I don't sound very convincing on it. I'm, I'm, I'm but it's, I mean, we work through it. We come to some good conclusions okay, there, cool. I think. All right. I feel like that discussion may help. Yeah. All right, our next question. Um, how to increase libido on strong antidepressants? Yeah, so I guess all of the SSRIs, which is the antidepressant medication group, affect libido and affect erectile functioning um, and can affect lots of sexual functioning. Uh, so... Let's just talk about increasing libido um, broadly. We know that um, so if you're in a relationship and you're trying to increase the libido within that relationship, um, you might want to have lots of touch throughout the day, lots of just connection. Um, You'd want to be looking at uh, lots of exercise. Um, Diet, exercise, and sleep are the three things that I know come across pretty much every topic that you've spoken about so far, but they also Mm -hmm. affect sex. And so you want to be making sure that you're um, like sexually active at your time that you're most energetic. So probably not as you're hopping into bed to go to sleep for the night, which is kind of, I guess, uh, um, I feel like not only has that become a cultural norm, it's kind of like when else is there time? Yeah, well, you can make time for it. It could be like an afternoon delight or it could be some sort of early morning wake up call. I think Mm -hmm. it kind of depends on the couple. So the, Libido increasing activities is also around like sensual touch, right? And so for um, some activities that we look at is like we call them sensate focus activities. And what we're really doing is no sexual genital 
touch all erogenous zone touching. So we've got multiple erogenous zones and for some people they're going to be more than others. Um, and Sam is squirming. Look at him, his little face. No, I just immediately, no, I just thought of a reference to Friends, that episode of Friends. Oh, oh yeah, like a one, like, a one, two, a one, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. three, yeah. <laughs> yes. A seven, 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 yes. seven. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yes, exactly. exactly. That episode, I immediately, and I was like, like, I got to contain myself. I can't. <laughs> no, I think it's a very helpful visual here. Like, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what she's talking about. So you want to explore all of the um, other erogenous zones um, and just kind of explore pleasure. So and, I, you mentioned, so for erogenous zones, because that episode of Friends, I felt like I was Chandler watching that. I was like, yeah, there's like three. Like, come on. <laughs> and then she was like, what, 11, 12 or something? Like, is it different for everyone or is that like? So what do you know? What erogenous zones do you know? Well, I don't. I don't. I couldn't. I'm not quite sure what we're talking I know, about. I could, when we say erogenous zones. I'm going to be honest. Well, you got your obvious ones, but like you know, I say I don't want to. Fi- I can't say it. Say it. <laughs> this uh, is part of expanding your vocabulary, Sam. Say it. This is safe space. You can you can say the word. Why words. does this make it harder for me to say it now? Because we're both like. Yeah, you're both like waiting for me to say it now. I'm like ODD. I really don't want to now. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to back this up. I'm going to take it over for you and save you the shame. Thank you. I appreciate that. And by that, I just mean your own embarrassment. Um, all right, so we're, talk- we're talking about erogenous zones. We're talking about parts of the body that feel amazing, um, and they will be different for different people. But we know, like, the ears, very sensitive. Um, so, like, in the context of spinal injury, we know that the level of injury becomes, like, as in, like, the level of where they've had their injury. I'm pointing at my own – the skin around that area becomes very heightened in sensation so we're talking about very sensitive parts of the body that and so that can become very pleasurable but it might be with different like that something might be pleasurable with one particular um like temperature or texture or pressure and like so the ears might be really pleasurable with like something soft and gentle but not so much if you were like tweaking them as opposed to like other parts of the body which might like a little bit more pressure um and then, anyway, moving down, the body, the mouth, the nipples, the inner forearm, the... <laughs> so like, <laughs> Sam and I both just, like, looked at each other like, what? <laughs> so you, could, you could get I your fingernails. on a daily basis. I know. It like, tickle. T- it's kind of ticklish, eh? It's kind of pleasurable. Yeah, I just thought that was a I'm ticklish everywhere kind oh, of thing. Oh, maybe. It depends on if you find tickling pleasurable or irritable. Right. So, Move basically, on. what we mean is... Anywhere to touch on your body that feels good. Amazing. Thank you. So much quicker. Yeah. You're going to list them all. <laughs> yeah. Not now. We're going to move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, what was that related to? I don't even remember How to anymore. increase libido on strong antidepressants. Right. Do you have an antidepressant-specific tip or not? Nah? You need to acknowledge that the medication has played a role in dampening the libido and sexual functioning, but not letting it dominate. And so kind of prioritizing sex prioritizing sex, making time for sex, um, and the in- and the big part of this is intimacy in your relationship. So it isn't necessarily that people will say, oh, I've, we've got to reduce libido and that's distressing. What they're usually kind of saying is I'm in a relationship and my reduced libido is distressing in our relationship because we're having less intimacy and bonding opportunities. And so it's like, well, how do you address your intimacy and bonding opportunities and how do you communicate and dialogue around your reduced libido? And the activities you do that increase your libido have to all be conscious. So mind, mindful masturbation, mindfully thinking about um, prioritizing it in the relationship and then the basic sleep, eat, exercise, having a really healthy diet, addressing your mental health. This is interesting to me because I feel like Addressing your other areas of health is yeah. one really good tip. Yeah. You know, um, diet, exercise, sleep. Um, and then also like that, the, what was it you were saying about erogenous zones, like with addressing intimacy, like that will increase the libido as well. Yep. And also I think acknowledging body image is a big part of this. So if you're not feeling great, if your mental health is, if you are depressed and anxious or um, struggling and just generally feeling a bit crap about life, then of course you're not going to feel particularly sexy. Like it's it's they're all interconnected. Where uh, the emotional, physical, social, spiritual, sexual things. So mm-hmm. kind of it's a balancing act, right? So you need to be feeling good. So in that way, if, if the antidepressants are addressing 
you know, obviously your depression, then it's, they would like to adjust your, deb- your libido, you probably wouldn't want to come off them. You probably want to try other yeah, things. Yeah, other things. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But I think acknowledging the fact that antidepressants do play a role yeah. Yeah. in sexual dysfunction, that I think it's, you have to have that conversation. I think a lot of people don't realize that when they take their medication initially, that there may well be an impact on their sexual functioning. Yeah. All right, our next question. Um, we just have so many of them. I don't know. We're going to have to move through them. It's okay. Quick. We'll go quicker. Most people lose their passion. What do you suggest to keep that going? Lose their I passion in their relationship? Like, I think it's kind of like, you know, when, like in movies, it's like, oh, they get married and have kids and now they never have sex ever, ever again. Like how well, do you keep sad. that passion going? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think to increase and maintain the passion in your relationship you need to think of it like a car, right? And you've got to do maintenance on your car. You can't just drive the car and then all of a sudden it clunks out on the side of the road. You need to service it and put petrol in it and put oil in it. And all Why does it things. sound so sexy? <laughs> you need to service it and put petrol in it? And like, <laughs> the way I talk about it, Em. Um, <laughs> I think, but this is just my analogy to try and think about your relationship like any yeah. other, you know, part of your life that needs – to be invested in and maintained. And so passion is, um, I guess, something that comes from shared interests, shared life goals, um, knowing each other in, like we call this, like love maps, like knowing each other's um, lives, having interesting conversations, being intellectually stimulated in each other, uh, touching each other, prioritizing time for fun. Fun is a huge part of passion. So I don't know go back and play sport together or do whatever it is that you did when you first started dating before you had kids, get that back in. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do we spice things up without making him slash her upset? Okay. Oh. So we talk about desire, right? And so people, ev- like everyone has desires. It's just a matter of whether or not you're willing and able to talk about them. And so the first part of spicing things up is communicating and talking about it. So if, we kind of have like this, imagine like a circle. And so this is like our pool of desires. And sometimes we might have um, the opportunity to share that with our partner. My desire is to introduce spanking into our relationship. Now, the <laughs> this is all, look at the two of you, so mature. <laughs> Sorry. And then, <laughs> Just such a good example. I and then not. you would float the idea in verbal communication and it's consensual and the person would be like, okay, tell me a little bit more about, what you why you want to do that how do you think it's going to be pleasurable for you i'm I'm very interested in exploring what this could be like maybe or maybe not and dialoguing around it negotiating kind of what the spice it up might look like i feel like you should have like an annual business meeting for sex Uh, yeah (laughs) sam it's so true you should have regular conversations in your relationship about how things are going and sex is on the agenda quarterly Qu- qu- quarterly. quarterly business meetings <laughs> how are we going financially how are we going in the housing department how are we going in the parenting department how are we going sexually you know it's just on the agenda item yeah okay um and the last question is kind of we've definitely already answered this um i'm never comfortable talking to my friends about anything in detail is that weird neither that's my answer is neither. So oh, it's your answer. I feel like your friends in detail about sex or just at all? About anything well, in life? The question just says, oh, I think about sex. Is that weird that they don't want to talk about it in detail? No. Which I think, I no. Think totally like, but it, like, personal. That, that's fine, right? If you don't Absolutely. want to talk about it, don't. don't. Right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Normalize it, but like be comfortable about it. If you don't want to talk about it, you still don't have to. Absolutely. And clearly we're uncomfortable talking about it as well, yeah. so don't have feel you, alone. Have you heard my talk time in this podcast? It's probably been the lowest it's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I think people should just stay in their window of tolerance and whatever makes them feel comfortable, stay there. Don't feel the need to start talking about sex all the time because you listen to this podcast and we talked about sex for an hour. I think the main thing is people want to feel like they've left a conversation safe like they don't want to walk away from a yeah. conversation and be like, oh, my God, I totally over-disclosed and now I'm embarrassed and yikes. Like you don't want people to be and, – and that's the same for anything in this that doesn't make you comfortable. Just delete it out. Like we we need to just stay in our window of tolerance and other people are going to be wanting to talk about 
sex more than somebody else, and that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so our second problem um, is another taboo topic, which is spirituality, even though it's not really taboo to us. It's well, kind of taboo. I think it's taboo in the sense that it's like if you bring it up at us, it's not. It's a bit weird to talk about. It's not, yeah. yeah. It can be difficult. It feels to talk normal about. in my life, though. But yes, it tends to be ignored. Yeah, like, yeah. Anyway, so isn't that saying act- don't talk about sex, religion, and politics? Yeah. So we should talk it. about politics, Max. We'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to talk about um, your your one of your research areas, which is spirituality, but from an academic perspective, because it is a research area. So I'd love to know more about. Um, how that works. Mm -hmm. So our research area has been spirituality's contribution to resilience, right? So my colleague, her PhD was in that, looking at spirituality's contribution to resilience. And then in the hospital, the bit that I've been involved with has been, all right, we know that spirituality contributes positively to resilience. Okay, why resilience though as well? Can you? What? Why are we researching resilience? Yeah, I guess, like, from a rehab perspective, is that... Yeah, so, I mean, you think about catastrophic injury, we're talking about a big loss, yeah. huge loss, a big life upheaval. And so it's sort of like how do you make meaning and purpose and pull that mm-hmm. together. Um, right, and, of course, that. meaning and purpose, that's, like, purely spiritual. There we go. You found the connection. You don't need me here. Um- <laughs> <laughs> no, but how, how would one research that? Okay, so what we've been looking at, uh, I mean, we've got lots of different projects, but the one I just want to talk about very quickly is around how you talk about spirituality. And um, I listened to your podcast that, like with Annie, where you guys were talking about spirituality, and I think the question mm-hmm. you asked them was, like, does it, is it spiritually important? Yeah. Yeah. And so my question, when I was listening to that, I was like, yes, Sam, spirituality is important. <laughs> um, and it's, and the, the next question or the follow-up statement to that is, is to ask, it's not a matter of if people are spiritual. It's a matter of how people are spiritual. Right. Okay. So. And I guess that, and that comes back to how you define what spirituality is. Yeah. And, I, and yeah. And so I guess the definition that we meaning. work with is more around, you know, transcendence so what transcends you from your daily experience um and Ooh. so if you think about spirituality as a big umbrella term and underneath that umbrella falls multiple things so the tra- the spirituality is what transcends what lifts you up and then under that you can have music and art and dance and connecting with the natural world connecting in relationship with other people religion for some people but not for everyone um and if you think about spirituality as multiple different things for different people, connection with animals, connection, it's about the connection piece. So that's why I come back and say it's not a matter of if people are spiritual, it's about how people are spiritual. And so then in our context of the hospital, it's about understanding how, how people are spiritual. And then if there's a spiritual need in the rehab setting, how do we meet that need? So – if somebody's spiritual because they go to the beach and they sit and look at the stars at night and it's about how are you connected to something bigger than yourself and how do we incorporate that into hospitals? What would research – I'm struggling to connect how that – like so when you say research. Okay. How- so what are we doing? What's our project? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the thing we've been working on is a training program for health professionals. So we do pre-measures around their confidence, competence to talk about spirituality and post-measures after they've attended our training. So the first part of the training is an online one-hour module, which has lots of videos of people talking about um, what spirituality means to them post-injury, whether they've had a spinal injury or brain injury. Um, It uses some um, different definitions around spirituality. And then the other part of the training is they come to a a one-and-a-half-hour face-to-face uh, workshop where we talk about what they learnt in the module one and then we introduce um, brain work for how to talk about spirituality. And this is teaching staff members. Staff members about how to talk to patients about spirituality because fantastic. you can't just like palm it off to a chaplain. We don't have chaplain. So you also acknowledge, acknowledging the fact that it may well be sitting in the gym and you're the physio and the person kind of 
wants to talk to you about it or you might be the nurse in the middle of the night and the person wants to talk to you about it. So it's so kind of upskilling the entire staff around how to talk about spirituality broadly and have a broader understanding of spirituality so it's bigger than just religion. And then we do post measures and then we do follow-up measures and then we do a whole bunch of qualitative interviews around what is it that they have taken from the training and how it's changed their practice. And then you can now read our published manuscripts around the data and the outcomes from that training. Nice. That's so cool. One of my colleagues who is very smart said, why is it that we wait till we're dying to talk about existential issues? You know, like spirituality. Oh, not me. <laughs> Couldn't be me. Could be you. <laughs> All right. So clinicians in palliative care talk about spirituality. Yeah. And um, it's kind of like, well, why are we waiting until then? Because uh, rehab, yeah. you know, is a catastrophic. There's often a catastrophic injury. Yeah. There's a life-changing something. Like this is a perfect time to be talking about existential issues and mm -hmm. making meaning out of what's happened. And there we go. That's the link. That's how we end up researching spirituality in a health setting. Nice. All right. <laughs> so, Candice. <laughs> Yeah, you've got a problem for us. So my problem was how do you declutter books because I was looking and in my line of sight right now I have 19 books. I don't have books because I can't read because my attention span is too short. My anyway. solution to this problem is that um, I don't actually think it's a problem. I really like having a record of the books that I've read. Like it makes me really proud to have, still have them and be like, wow, look at all these books that I've read. Maybe that's just because I didn't, I haven't read a lot and now I am reading a lot and I have a like – a whole stash of all the books I've read this year and it makes me really proud to see them. Um, but maybe like That's how it starts, give them and to friends or recommend them or like mm. give them away to other people to read and then hopefully they will never give them back. I still, I don't really understand the problem. You you have books everywhere. Is that yeah. What Are and they then, like and then there's sexologists? Summer. PD, P, what do you have, post-grad books? Like are they textbooks? Are they no, fun books? I'm like right here I can see about five Lee Child books. And then there's like other random books. But it's sort of like once you read something, I really struggle with chucking it away. It's sort of like, when do you want to read it again? Okay, well then maybe do more like renting, I was going to say, borrowing library books. Borrowing the library, that's a good tip. My mom okay. is an avid library borrower. <laughs> and then she made me borrow, we're doing this like book club thing together because I was doing it anyway. And I was like, you read a lot. You should do this with me. And she made me borrow one of the books from the library. And now there's one book missing from my, my year's worth of books that I've read. And it hurts me. <laughs> but yes, borrowing from, borrow the, from library. the library. Easy. Done. Yep. And then you. you have to return them somewhere. We actually you get solved yeah. a problem. Then you actually yeah, have to return gonna... them. They're not yours to hoard. Yeah. Love it. Nice. Oh, my God. Well done. Is that the first time? We <laughs> first time we solved someone's problem. Stop buying books. Borrow from the library. It's better for the yeah. environment anyway. Should we get into some recommendations? Yes, we should. Ooh. Do you have a recommendation? I have two, second? but I feel like I should save one because I struggle to come up with them sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to do both anyway. Um, so my first recommendation is a food. And it is the Coles brand chocolate chip cookies. They're like dipped in chocolate as well. And they're super good. And then my other recommendation is uh, New Girl, the TV show. It's on Netflix. I used to love it and I refound it and I never watched the last seasons. Um, and it's just making me so happy every time I watch it. So is that with like Zoe Deschanel? Yeah. I have a fringe now. <laughs> she has a fringe. I have a fringe. <laughs> is that where they're? they're oh, you're like the same person. That. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's great. I wanted to recommend another podcast again. I'm back in a podcast again. I go through waves. Yeah. Um, I um, have been – I've like listened to like two episodes. I get obsessed with things. Um, there's uh, the Duncan Trussell Family Hour, I think is what it's called. It's actually – I've semi-recommended this before because Midnight Gospel on Netflix, um, I think I recommended that in Alf's episode. Yeah. And it's the podcast that that came from. All right. And there's – he's super like – spiritual and, and but also intellectual and he's a weird guy but um he just like he has these brilliant conversations with people he talked to dan Harmon, who created community and rick and morty and so like existentialism is all through dan Harmon's work and so their conversation is fantastic and i think tim my mate recommended that to me and that's how i listened to it and then yeah he has great guests and good chats so that's a good podcast nice 
I specifically recommend the Dan Harmon episode. I really like that one. Nice. Do you have a recommendation, Candice? I do, but mine's in the sexual health space. So my recommendation is to get a subscription to OMG Yes. I have heard of this. What is it? Emma Watson talked yeah, about it. Yeah, she did. Yeah. yeah. So o- OMG Yes is um, well, like a series of videos. It's a web page. Like it's got two seasons and it covers um, so many different topics around female sexual pleasure. And um, it's lots of very brave women speaking about what – is arousing and what is actually helpful to them to achieve orgasm and to enjoy sexual pleasure. And it's very good. Like it's got both videos, like of people talking about it, little diagrams that are very clever, like visually just like, Oh yeah, that's what they mean by that. Um, (laughs) And then some very graphic content, which they have a little thing saying, not suitable to watch at work. But I think that's clever too, because I do watch a lot of this at work and think, I don't necessarily think my colleagues around me who aren't working in the sexual service need to see the vagina. But <laughs> it is very, very good. So that's my recommendation. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was a huge conversation. It went in so many different directions, but really great, I think, to talk about these two particular taboo topics. I feel like we could have you on three more times and not ever talk about the same thing twice. Yeah, for sure. And we I probably feel like- will best of luck editing this, Emily. <laughs> yes, yes. Good luck to me tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but Thank yes, you. it's been awesome. Thank you so much. You're yeah. very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you can subscribe, leave us a review, follow us on Instagram, um, show us where you're listening by posting and tagging us on Instagram. We also have a Patreon account and you can uh, subscribe there and support us if you'd like. Also, the music is by The Vinyl Press and you can find them on Instagram at The Vinyl Press. Yeah, and send us any problems that you have. We want to solve them for you. Woo.